just how quickly can curiosity, passion and obsession die? Let's find out. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's me, Liam, aka Mr. Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and if you're watching this video, it's probably because you're after some poetry analysis. Great! So today's video is going to be about Seamus Heaney's poem, Death of a Naturalist, which can be found on page 14 of the WJEC Educas Poetry Anthology. Before we get started, I recommend that you grab a pen for notes, at least three different highlighters, and some extra paper too. Looking at the anthology, you'll definitely need that extra paper, as there's not much space for notes around the poem. Before we get started properly, I just thought I'd say that this is perhaps my favourite poem from the anthology, and if it's not my favourite, it's certainly the one that means the most to me. I actually studied this poem myself back when I took my GCSEs in 2010, and I think this poem was one that really switched me on to the study of poetry and English more generally. So who knows where I would be if it weren't for this poem or my fantastic English teachers. If you've watched any of my other videos in this series, you should know the structure by now. If somehow you've not watched any of those videos yet, then a link to the playlist they all appear in should be appearing on screen about now. So how about you click it and go through all of the anthology poems? So in this video I will read the poem, go through its context, provide a close reading, consider the poem's meaning, mood and the poet's motivation. I'll also think about themes and then finally at the end of the video there will be an optional revision task for you to complete. If my videos are helping you with your GCSE revision then please do let me know by dropping them a like, subscribing to my channel and turning on that notification bell too. And of course I welcome your input in the comments section. Questions about the poem, your own analysis and feedback are all welcome. Okay, so generic cringy YouTuber self-promotion aside, here is the poem. I've had to chop it up a bit as it's the joint longest poem in the anthology. As I read it, please make sure that you are following along. Death of a Naturalist All the year the flax dam festered in the heart of the townland. Green and heavy-headed flax had rotted there, weighted down by huge sods. Daily it sweltered in the punishing sun. Bubbles gargled delicately. Blue bottles wove a strong gauze of sound around the smell. There were dragonflies, spotted butterflies, but best of all was the warm thick slobber of frog spawn that grew like clotted water in the shade of the banks. Here, every spring, I would fill jam potfuls of the jellied specks to range on window sills at home, on shelves at school, and wait and watch until the fattening dots burst into nimble swimming tadpoles. Miss Walls would tell us how the daddy frog was called a bullfrog, and how he croaked, and how the mammy frog laid hundreds of little eggs, and this was frog spawn. You could tell the weather by frogs too, for they were yellow in the sun and brown in rain. Then one hot day when fields were rank with cow dung in the grass, and angry frogs invaded the flax dam, I ducked through hedges to a coarse croaking that I had not heard before. The air was thick with a bass chorus. Right down the dam 
gross-bellied frogs were cocked on sods, their loose necks pulsed like sails, some hopped, the slap and plop were obscene threats. Some sat poised like mud grenades, their blunt heads farting. I sickened, turned and ran. The great slime kings were gathered there for vengeance, and I knew that if I dipped my hand, the spawn would clutch it. So there we go, that is the poem. Remember, context is worth a third of the marks, which is why I always insist on going over it before analysing the poem. Seamus Heaney was an Irish poet who was born in 1939 and died in 2013. As such, he is not necessarily primarily a 21st century poet, but neither is he a poet from centuries ago. His death in 2013 was profoundly felt across the literary world. He was massively acclaimed. Now I know I've said that about quite a few of the anthology poets because, well, they are, but Heaney tops the lot, I think. He won numerous prizes and awards and honours in his lifetime, including the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1995. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that he is one of the most, if not the most, important and influential poets of the English language of the late 20th century. Heaney was a trained teacher, lectured at universities and was, of course, a poet. He grew up in rural Northern Ireland on his parents' farm. His upbringing can be seen across his poetry in the people, places and events it features. And death of a naturalist is no different. Heaney described his childhood as an intimate, physical, creaturely existence in suspension between the archaic and the modern in his Nobel Prize lecture. The idea of his childhood being physical and creaturely is especially relevant to this poem, I think. His brother Christopher was killed in a road accident in 1953 when he was four years old. This had a profound effect on Heaney and his writing, in which he often explored the loss of innocence. So when I was researching Heaney for this video, I thought that it was interesting that he first became a father in the same year that he published this poem. And yeah, the poem was published in a book that had the same name. I do wonder if him becoming a parent to a boy had him thinking about his own childhood and time as a boy. Certainly, this is a bit of context that I don't see other revision materials or revision videos even mention. Here we have the poem's title, which I've got two questions for. Before we look at them, this is your final reminder to get your three highlighters out and to set up a key for yourself. So there are my two questions for the title. Remember, it's important to have some analysis prepped for each poem's title, as you will definitely be given the title of each poem in your exam paper, even if they're not the poem for your first question. I think it's important to clarify a common misconception with the title of this poem. A naturalist is somebody who is an expert in or a student of nature, be that animal or plant life. It is not somebody who gets naked, which many students seem to think it is. Now that we've cleared up what a naturalist is, 
we can think a bit more about what the title means. Nobody dies in this poem, so it can't be about the literal death of a naturalist. And so we must think metaphorically. A naturalist can still die if they lose their passion or interest in nature, which is something that we do see happen in this poem. This metaphorical death could be seen as the loss of innocence or the loss of childhood, ideas that are said to feature in Heaney's poetry due to his younger brother's death. Here we have the poem's first four lines and accompanying them are one, two, three, four questions. So there they are. Pause the video if you want a go at answering them on your own first. Bested and rotted are both words related to decay and death. Although here they have been used in a more literal and natural way. By having language related to death early on in the poem though, Heaney may be foreshadowing the eventual metaphorical death of the poem's eponymous naturalist. Here I'm arguing that heart has been used to personify the townland. The flax dam, which is just a pool of water where flax, a plant, is placed to soften up, is at the townland's heart, which stresses that it is very important to the community and the persona. Nature and man seem to live in symbiosis. And although it is suggested that man and nature live symbiotically, it also seems that nature is at times in war with itself, as the sun is punishing the flax. This confrontational tone could be used to foreshadow the poem's warlike ending. Although the poem seems very positive about nature, its potential threat is recognised in the early stages of the poem. There's loads of alliteration in these lines. I've identified three examples with words starting with F, H and S, and it would be useful for you to highlight these as well as any others that you find in these lines and beyond. Heaney is a poet for whom the music of language really sings. In these lines, I'd argue that the alliteration makes the poem sound a bit like a nursery rhyme, a poetic form that relies heavily on sound. This, I argue, reflects the persona's youth. So here we have the poem's next six lines, but thankfully there's only one, two, three questions for them. Hopefully these questions are relatively straightforward and you should be able to give them a go on your own before seeing my ideas. Right, so there's an oxymoron present in the phrase gargled delicately. Since gargling can be quite a rough, guttural, blunt sound and anything but delicate. However, this use of oxymoron shows that the youthful persona finds pleasure in the sounds of nature, no matter how disgusting or obtuse they may be. I've counted the references to nature as images here because they all evoke a powerful picture in my mind. We've all seen blue bottle flies and so on before and so just by mentioning them they put images into our minds as readers. By including such a high number of nature images in such a short space creates a high image density suggesting that nature is alive and thriving, but also that the persona is fascinated by it 
as they notice so many of its aspects. The childlike language highlights the persona's naivety and innocence, and is evidenced by best of all and slobber. Childlike language will make an appearance later in the poem, so keep an eye out. And here we have the next few lines of the poem. And there are one, two, three, four questions that I'm going to be thinking about in relation to these lines. What ideas do they make you come up with? Please let me know in the comments section down below. The determiner, every, suggests that the persona's fascination with nature was longer lasting as they collected frog spawn repeatedly over a number of years. Okay, so the alliteration in jam potfuls of the jellied specks makes the persona's passion seem natural as jellied substances probably belong in jam jars, even linguistically. Jam potfuls, which is a made up word, it should be noted, is pluralized and so the persona's passion seems vast. The alliteration in wait and watch, as well as the repetition of and in this phrase, if you were to extend your highlighting back by a word, shows how absorbed the persona is in their passion, as they would seemingly observe the frog spawn for hours and hours. Battening dots burst is a lovely image, and it suggests that nature is alive, thriving, and full of energy. And here we have the end of the poem's first stanza. For these lines, I have one, two, three, four questions for you to think about. So why not pause the video and give them a go for yourself? Edie's language choices make it clear that the persona is young and also Irish. Young children have a habit of retelling what their teachers have told them in great detail, something that happens less and less in adolescence. Young children are also known to sometimes call male and female animals the mummies and daddies. Here though, Heaney has used mammy which is a word commonly used in Ireland, meaning mummy. Connected to youth, the persona's naivety and innocence are also exemplified as they take Miss Walls's words as gospel and put total faith in what she has told them. Again, through his language choices, Heaney has captured the youthfulness of the poem's persona, this time by repeating and three times in one sentence. If you have any primary school age siblings or family members, listen out for how often they say and. However, this repetition of and also shows the persona's enthusiasm and passion for nature. Their knowledge is practically spilling out of them and their sentences seem to never end. Rain generally has negative connotations. Through mentioning it, Heaney could be hinting at something negative on the poem's horizon. The abrupt ending of the line and stanza, I'm sure you've noticed that this bottom line in rain is considerably shorter than the rest of the poem, could foreshadow the sudden metaphorical death that is in the next stanza. This abrupt ending, combined with the negative connotations contained within the line, means that this line could be considered the poem's falter. So here we have the beginning of the poem's second and final stanza. There are stark differences between this stanza 
and the one before it. And as such, it is analytically rich. Here are the one, two, three, four, five questions that I will be considering in just a moment. But why don't you pause the video first, have a think, and write down some of your own ideas down in the comments section. So if you want answers to those five questions, well, tough. You're going to have to wait just a little bit longer until part two of my analysis of death of a naturalist drops, which is going to be really, really soon. But just to make sure you don't miss out on that second part of my analysis of the poem, how about you subscribe to my channel and turn on that notification bell too? That way you won't miss it. Thanks for watching and I hope you have an awesome rest of the day. Cheers.